In this video, I'm going to be going over the first homework for Dr. Collini's Chem 2380 class. Question one says, a compound with a molecular formula C10H14 gave the following proton NMR spectrum. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just draw a rough sketch of what this NMR looks like. Um, it looks like there are four signals and they're already ordered from the smallest shift to the largest. So we have a doublet, a singlet, a septet, and a multiplet. And those are at 1.2, 2.3, 2.8, and 7.1 parts per million, respectively. So I'm just going to draw those all in. This isn't perfectly to scale, but the multiply is kind of further off to the left than everything else. So the next thing that I want to do is just make sure that I have matched up my n number, so the number of like neighbors that each of these signals is indicating. So the doublet is going to have an n of 1, singlet is n equals 0, the septet is n equals 6, and the multiplet is actually unknown because it's a multiplet, so we don't actually know how many neighbors this is going to have. But based on the fact that all of our possible answers have a benzene ring in it, I think it's pretty likely that this multiplet is indicative of the benzene ring. So next I'm going to try to figure out what the rest of these signals could possibly represent. So we know this septet that's highlighted in blue here needs to be a proton environment that has six neighbors. So I'm going to guess that it's probably going to be this blue proton here. And the reason I say that is because when we look at the adjacent carbons, there's two methyl groups that are going to each have three protons. So that makes up a total of six neighbors. And I've drawn all of the other protons in yellow because we know that there's that yellow doublet that indicates that there's a proton environment that only has one neighbor. And so this isopropyl group um, seems pretty likely given that we have the combination of a doublet and a septet. That's pretty indicative that you're going to have an isopropyl group on your final compound. So it's likely going to be either two or five. So molecule two has a methyl group, which would have three protons that are all in a chemically equivalent environment. And the only adjacent carbon is that sp2 hybridized carbon that doesn't have any hydrogens, which means that the signal in green would be a singlet, which matches up with what we've seen in our given spectrum. Whereas if we look at molecule five, there should be a signal for that um, secondary carbon just off of the benzene. Um, and that signal would have been a doublet because of the neighboring hydrogen to the right. So because of that, we know that molecule two is the correct answer. Question two asks, what is the structure of the compound in the following proton NMR spectrum with a molecular formula C8H14 with the following integrations? So zooming in, the first peak on the far right looks like a triplet, so I'm going to write that in yellow. The second peak looks like a singlet, and that's going to be highlighted in green. And finally, the last peak is a quartet, and that will be shown in blue. So for the triplet, I'm going to try to make a guess as to what I think this triplet is indicative of. Um, because it integrates to three and it's around one parts per million, and we know the n value is two because it's a triplet, I'm going to guess that this signal is indicative of an ethyl group. And the reason I say that is because when you have an ethyl group, you have a primary carbon that has three protons on the, on the end of it, and those three protons are directly adjacent to a carbon with two protons. So there's two neighbors, which means that the splitting pattern would be three. Moving on to the singlet, um, a singlet that integrates to nine is almost always going to be a tert butyl group. I can't think of any examples of when it wouldn't be. And the reason that this makes sense is because if you were to draw a tert butyl group, you're going to have three carbons that each have three protons and all, all nine of those protons are going to be chemically equivalent. So they're all going to make one signal. So again, it's one signal that integrates to nine. So it seems pretty likely that it is a tert butyl group. And the fact that it's a singlet, which means that it has no neighbors, is also indicative that it's this tert-butyl group because all of those nine protons are adjacent to that carbon that doesn't have any protons on it, so it would be a singlet with no neighbors. Moving on to the quartet, we know that the n value is going to equal three, and it's going to integrate to two. Sorry, the screen jumped around a little bit. Let's scroll back down. So it integrates to two, it has an n value of three. We'd previously guessed that there's an ethyl group based on the yellow protons, and this further solidifies that we have an ethyl group because there are two protons in this environment and they have three neighbors, which is the three yellow protons. So it seems pretty likely that this is in fact an ethyl group. So now that we have an idea of what functional groups we should be looking for, we can go through the possible options and try to eliminate things. So first with option A, I'm not seeing an ethyl group 
or a terbutyl group, so this is not likely to be the one that we are interested in. Option B has an ethyl group off to the right, um, so that matches up with our guess, but the left side has an isopropyl group, which does not match with the terbutyl that we've predicted, so it's probably not going to be B. Option C has both an ethyl group and a terbutyl group, so that seems promising. However, the sp2 hybridized carbons have um, two protons that are unaccounted for in the signal. So I'm going to go ahead and draw those in so you can see what I'm talking about there. So in blue, we have these two protons. Um, there's no signal to represent those two protons anywhere in the graph, so it's not likely to be B. Option D has both a tert-butyl group and an ethyl group, and there's no other protons. So it looks like this might be our answer, but let's go ahead and take a look at E just to be sure. Option E does have the tert-butyl group, but then it has these two secondary carbons that each have two protons, um, as well as the terminal alkyne has a lone proton off to the far right by itself, so that's not going to match with the signals shown in our graph, so we can be sure now that D is in fact the correct answer. Moving on to question 3, what is the structure of the compound in the following proton NMR spectrum with a molecular formula C9H10O2 with the following integrations? So the first thing that I notice is that there are four signals, which will correspond with four unique proton environments. So now I'm going to try to figure out what those environments might be. So going one by one through each of these peaks, starting on the far right, um, this first one looks like a triplet. I'm going to zoom in better so you can see it. Um, I'm going to make kind of a chart down below of the splitting, the end value, the integration, and the shift, so I can get a better idea of what each of these signals might represent. So in this case, because it's a triplet, the end value will be 2, the integration is 2, the shift is right around 2 parts per million, and I'm going to guess that it's this CH2CH2 group, and the reason I think that is because we have these two triplets that are both right around 2 parts per million, and they both integrate to 2, so we need two compounds that each integrate to two and only have two neighbors. So um, again, I'm highlighting this other triplet in blue. It has the exact same end value and integration and roughly the same shift. So because they are two triplets right next to each other and they both integrate to two, it seems pretty likely that it's going to be some sort of CH2CH2 motif going on here. The next signal is this multiplet that integrates to five and it is going to have a shift right around 7. Um, so in this case, we don't know what the end value is because it's a multiplet, but it integrates to 5. It has a shift around 7. It seems pretty likely that this is going to be a benzyl group of some sort, and based on the shown answer, the answers that we can choose from, that seems pretty likely that it's going to be a benzyl group. And then again, because it integrates to 5, that means that this benzene group should only have one other substituent, and the other five should be protons, which I've drawn there in red. And last but not least, we have this singlet that integrates to one, and it shows up right around 12 parts per million. All three of those things combined seem pretty likely that this is going to be a carboxylic acid group. There's nothing else in our table that we know of that shifts that far left, and because it's a singlet and it integrates to one, so it has no neighbors, it seems pretty likely that it is. So now that we've identified a couple of pieces to our puzzle, let's see if we can connect them together to figure out what the final molecule looks like. So starting with option A, it has the benzene ring and it has the CH2CH2 that we're looking for, but on that far right it has an aldehyde, not a carboxylic acid, and remember aldehydes show up around 10 parts per million, not 12, so A is probably not the answer we're looking for. So moving on to option B, it does have a carboxylic acid which is promising and it has the CH2CH2 group, however it's missing the double bonds to make a benzene ring, so that signal does not match with what's shown in our graph, so B is probably not the answer either. So looking at option C, we have the benzene ring, we have a CH2CH2 group, and we have a carboxylic acid, so all of our puzzle pieces seem to be accounted for, but let's take a look at D just to be sure that that's not an option. Option D has a benzene ring with only four protons and two substituents. That does not match with the five protons shown in our integration, so D is not the correct option, which means that C is indeed the answer we're looking for. Oh, sorry, I forgot there's also an option E down here. This has the carboxylic acid and the benzene ring, however, it has this methyl group that has a proton on the left and then three protons on the right, which does not match our two and two integration peaks, so E is also not an option. Question 4 asks us to explain why the molecule N2 doesn't show up in the IR spectrum, and this is because N2 only contains one bond and it's nonpolar, and that nonpolar bond is not going to show up in an IR spectrum. Question 5 asks us to note any significant changes that would occur in the spectrum 
um, when we do the following reaction. So we start with an alcohol and replace the alcohol group with a bromine. I think it's helpful to make note of any bonds that we expect to see in each of the compounds. So first we have this carbon-oxygen bond, which is probably going to show up around 1700 wave numbers. And then we also have an oxygen-hydrogen bond, and that should show up around 3,300 wave numbers. Moving on to the alkyl bromide, um, I wasn't able to find any definitive answers in our textbook about the carbon-bromine bond, but I'm going to guess that it probably exists around 16 to 1,700 wave numbers just because it's a carbon to heteroatom. However, there's no hydrogen to heteroatom bonds in this molecule, so there's not going to be a signal at 3,300. So answer A looks like the correct answer to me. Question six notes that a liquid sample of an alcohol tends to have a really broad OH peak, but if the IR spectrum uses a gaseous sample, it's going to have really sharp peaks. And this is because of hydrogen bonding. So when you have a liquid sample, all of the alcohols are capable of hydrogen bonding to another and one another, and that changes the strength of the bonds. So you're going to have a bit of a range of signals where they all um, absorb. Whereas if you have a gaseous sample, they're too far apart to have any notable interactions. So they're all going to have the same strength of bond, so the peaks will be very distinct right at basically the same wave number. In question 7, we need to identify the molecular ion peak. So this is always going to be the further rightmost signal that is of significance, so not the little itty bitty signal right at 45 that is um, just representing the carbon-13 isotope, but the one directly next to it, that's going to be our molecular ion peak, or in other words, 44 is the molecular weight of our starting molecule. So that brings us to the end of this homework packet. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to review anything that was covered here.